Thank you very much, Daddy, for the kind words. He said, can you all hear me? Those who cannot hear me, raise their hand. Obviously, if they can't hear me, how will they raise their hand? <laughs> Those who can hear me, raise your hand. Those who are not sure, raise your hand. <laughs> I am very happy to come to Boston and to New England. I first came to this country to spend a year studying in the Graduate School of Public Administration at Harvard in 1962. That's after a long time I am renewing contact and I hope to make frequent visits to this place in the future. Nice to meet some old friends and make some new ones on this trip. The titles for my talks are set by my hosts, very often without informing me what those titles are. <laughs> they take me by surprise sometimes, and I just share what I, whatever I can based upon my association with the spiritual and mystic traditions of India, and especially what I learned from a great spiritual teacher, whom I call the Great Master, a lot of people call him the Great Master in India. So, a lot of sharing that I do here is uh, coming from a parrot-like repetition of what I heard. So, even if it uh, sounds like an intellectual uh, analysis of a particular subject, it is not really so. It is more a repetition of what I heard about the subject from a spiritual teacher. The title set for this evening's lecture is The Anatomy of Fear. The word anatomy must have been picked up from my recent book called Anatomy of Consciousness. And fear being an important component of consciousness, I think whoever set the subject thought this was a very logical and appropriate subject to follow from anatomy of consciousness. Actually, I think it is a good subject because fear creates more problems in our life than any other single factor. Therefore, if we can have a close look at fear and what causes fear and how we can overcome fear and how we can uh, remove the causes of fear, it would make a big qualitative difference in our lives. There are some simple statements which we hear over and over again about fear. One is that fear is always of the unknown. When you know something, you are not afraid. When you know the thing or the experience, you are not afraid, you have some other response. But when you do not know, then you are afraid. Let me illustrate. If you know somebody is going to shout at you, you are not afraid. If you do not know if that person will or will not shout, you are afraid. The uncertainty of what might happen creates fear. If you are certain, a certain thing is going to happen, there is no fear. A particular school in India examined this question of emotional response to different situations. And they wanted to take a very concrete, earthy, simple stimulant for, t uh, for fear in order to test out whether what frightens most people would frighten a person if that person is given knowledge about that event. Most people were afraid of going into a big dense forest in which a man-eater tiger, a man-eating tiger was lurking and roaming around and would attack and kill the person who would be there. This was a good setting for testing out fear. So, 
people were sent there to see what would happen to them and all the mechanical devices of measuring fear like the uh, variations in the heartbeat in the respiration in uh, blood circulation in the different uh, waves alpha beta and theta gamma waves of the brain all the experimental work that has been done now to make a study of responses of human beings to such situations as fear were put on the gadgetry was on the people and when they were told that there is a lion or a tiger in this forest now you go around tremendous fear was experienced when they were not even told from which direction the lion or tiger will come when the direction was specified that he cannot come from this side the lion or tiger will come only from this direction the fear reduced instead of going up when they were told the lion can be caught by his paws and will not hit you if you catch him in a particular way he is coming from this side as soon as the lion became visible which was of course a trick played on them that was not a real lion as soon as the lion was visible the fear was replaced by a different emotion the emotion being that of strength of either escaping running up a tree just running away or doing something other than just collapsing under fear fear was making them weak as if the whole energy was being sapped and that new emotion made them strong that they have to deal with it because now it is in front of them this is just one example but uh, in the course of the last two or three decades that i have been propounding this uh, uh, philosophy that fear is always caused by something that we are not sure of that we don't know and not caused by something of which we are positive and certain i have seen that even such abstract things like the fear of what could be happening in life after death what is death what does it take away from us when we see people dying and not staying back to tell us what happened when they died when we are not even sure if the stories they tell us about near death are the same stories as of death because if they had really died there wouldn't be near death we don't know what has happened this total ignorance and uncertainty of death makes people uh, get so afraid of death that it is amazing that people are afraid of a single thing which is the only real definite thing that is bound to happen in the life of every person who is born one indian philosopher was once listing out the things about which there is no question absolutely certain no doubt at all and he could list only two things of which there is no doubt whatsoever one was that i as consciousness exist because i am questioning asking i don't know whether the form is real or not but the questioner is there the statement that is being made in consciousness is a self evident existing fact which we do not question because it is there as a continuous experience that is one certainty and the second was death and there was no other certainty i know uh, some years ago i mentioned that the only real two certain things are that you exist and that you will die in the form in which you identify yourself with the physical being somebody in the audience said there's a third thing also which i didn't realize and that is it is certain that you will pay taxes so that of course applies only to certain sections of certain affluent countries like this but uh, we we have in many countries lot of tax evaders they are certain they will not pay taxes but the point i am making is that the elements of experience about which we are certain are very limited the elements on which we are uncertain are very large and so many therefore fear has become a natural way of life for us human beings
we can't help it. When we are uncertain, we are afraid. There is a more appealing way of explaining this situation. And the appealing way is that is it natural for us to be uncertain or is it unnatural? I remember when I came to school here at Harvard, there were many levels of teachers, young professors, some old deans of the departments, some absolutely young lecturers just trying their stint at teaching for a while in summer school. But I found that the newcomers were very definite in the statements they made because whatever they read in the books, they made the statement that was knowledge. But the wiser a professor grew, the older he became, the more his speeches became like maybe, perhaps, it could be, yes, that is also possible. So we had uh, experienced long-term veterans who would not be able to say anything without adding maybes and perhaps. This sense of uncertainty, why should it come with experience of life, especially to educated, civilized people, that the more educated they are, the more veteran they are, the more they have lived life, they should be more uncertain. Why should that happen? The reason which is offered by an, a spiritual analyst is that they have grown in their life using their minds, which means the word mind, I use it, is in terms of intellectual faculties. The faculties of thinking, reasoning, logic, these intellectual faculties are the ones they have most employed to get knowledge and to get along in life. They have in their careers also used the same intellectual faculties to go up. So as they employed their intellectual faculties of the mind, they became more and more analytical. And since the process of analysis, since the logical process of analysis, itself creates more and more alternatives. They became more and more uncertain of which alternative they could rely upon. If you have in your day-to-day -day life a particular problem and you want to see in what way can I solve this problem and something comes in front of you, this is the way you can solve your problem and then you start thinking about it. The more you think, the more alternatives come up and the more uncertain you become of the way you can solve your problem. Problem solving through the logical intellectual process is very hard because you are never sure. Supposing you have a relationship with a person whom you love. You like that person, you are attracted to that person. And you feel you are just made for each other and you associate with each other and then you start thinking about that relationship. The more you think, the less sure you are about the relationship. People have destroyed their love lives by overthinking about it. Supposing you are sure what you have to do tomorrow morning and you get up and start thinking hard, spend half an hour thinking what you have to do, you'll be more confused than ever before. You can try these things. It is not that there is something wrong with the person who is doing it. It is an inbuilt nature of thinking that thinking will create this kind of alternative to decision making, an alternative option available to you and leave you in a situation where you are not sure which option to take. If you said, I am going to go this way, I know it. And somebody says, how do you know it? I don't know how, it's just a gut feeling, it's a hunch. Intuitively I know I have to do it, then you will do it. But if you say, let me see what else can I do, you will not be sure whether you should do it at all or not. I had an interesting experience conducting a workshop for business executives. 
I did not come with my credentials as a disciple of the great master. I came as a management expert who had written uh, treaties on the way management should be conducted in large corporations, in government agencies, and whose word, words had been uh, reproduced in international magazines. So I came entirely with different credentials and I conducted a workshop for actual corporate decision makers at a fairly high level so that only vice presidents, executive vice presidents and presidents of companies and chairmen of board were really present, just about 20 of them. And therefore, they knew their jobs well. They knew what they were supposed to do. So I was trying to make a presentation to them that in the course of decision making, we do not always employ our intellectual process. That this is a fallacy, that because we can think clearly, therefore we are good managers. But to prove my point, I gave them a sheet of paper each around the table with a pencil for convenience, and I said, on this sheet of paper, write down the 10 most important decisions you have ever made in your life. So they all started writing down because they were all experienced people, all 40 and plus 40 over. They had seen life, more than half of it, and they knew what was required to be done. Since they were to write down the 10 most important decisions, it took them no time to remember the important decision and they started writing. I had earlier asked them on the other side of the same sheet to write out the methods they employed for decision making, which most of them said they used analysis, they used analysts, they used deputies, they used uh, other personnel who could analyze problems, give them charts, equations, various ways of looking at a problem, the economic side, the growth pattern, various kinds of things, computers, memory, retrieval systems, information. They, they, were, they had written down a long list, long list of methods, mechanical and mental, which they had used for decision making. And when in the middle of it I asked them to turn the page and write down the 10 most important decisions, naturally one would expect that they would write the same decisions which were taken by following that, that process. But the same people who had written down the various methods they employed for decision making, when they actually wrote down the 10 most important decisions, and when asked to check off which of these decisions employed the methods they had written on the other sheet, could not check off more than 30% of their decisions. Which means 70% of corporate decisions taken by these chiefs of those corporations were not based upon those methods which they thought they were employing to take decisions. In the course of the workshop, we went over those decisions to see how did they take those decisions. And a majority of the participants in the workshop came up with an interesting single answer to their most important decisions. They said, we took the decision on hunch. You know what is hunch? Hunch is intuition. Hunch is gut knowledge. <coughs> hunch is a sudden flash of knowing something that comes without thinking. Hunch does not come by thinking. It comes without thinking. What comes by thinking is an intellectual thing. What comes without thinking is an intuitive thing. And it was found that the most important decisions in their corporate life, which had built up their companies and made them successful people, were taken by them unknowingly through the intuitive process and not through the intellectual process. They were themselves surprised, as much as I was, that such a thing was going on and they did not know it was going on. Therefore, we are constantly using a process in us which is called the intuitive process 
which is not related to the intellectual process, which does not relate to thinking, and which is very positive, which is free from perhaps, nobody has ever had a hunch, perhaps I should do this. I never heard anybody say that. Nobody has had an intuitive message that perhaps one should consider this. These are thoughts. The words perhaps, possibly, maybe, always come with the intellectual thinking. They don't come with the hunch. Hunch comes suddenly and says, I know it's right. I don't know why. I don't know how I got it. But I know it. And when I look at the number of people who tell me, I wish I had listened to my intuition. I wouldn't have made a mess of my life. When I keep on listening to, to this over and over again, I realize how quickly we brush aside the intuitive knowledge that we have by overuse of the mind and thoughts, which only create more alternatives, more option, more uncertainty, and therefore more fear. Whenever we are unsure, there is more fear. It is in fact proven over and over again that fear as an emotion, fear as a response, fear as a physical reaction to a stimulus, all this comes out of ignorance. And fear is, can be tracked down always to the unknown. If you don't know, you are afraid. If you know, you are not afraid. It is as simple as that. But the system works in such a way that we mask this fear all the time by so much of mental verbiage, by thoughts and uh, feelings covered with thoughts which seem to say, no, I understand this, I understand all this, but somehow there is some fear in me. Maybe I should overcome fear by some other method. There is only one real method to overcome fear, and that is to know that of which you are afraid. This has been used, this uh, method is therapeutically proved also by psychologists who when they want to remove the fear of a patient, they put that patient face to face with the encounter of which the patient has not enough knowledge, so the fear disappears. I had the same experience in Michigan when five uh, hospitals participated in a workshop that I conducted on the therapeutic values of going to a different level of consciousness than the thought process. And they didn't understand what these different levels are. They only knew one level. Be be besides the conscious thoughts that we have, the only other level they knew was a subconscious level or what they called unconscious level, whatever you like to label it which is where you want to sync information, sync events, sync memories, because you are afraid to face them. That is what they knew. They thought all fears in human beings come because we have suppressed memories into the subconscious and that their method was, if you want to take the fear out of a person, give him an opportunity to relive the episode which created the memory that they are trying to avoid and lies buried in their subconscious. And they used a very standard technique of bringing up those memories. They would use two broad methods at that time. Now probably psychologists and psychiatrists have advanced further. At that time the two methods used were the free association indicators method, which means they allowed you, allowed the patient to think freely on certain words they would list. And if there was an emotional response to a particular word, they would say this is the connection between this person's fear and the suppressed subconscious memory. So from there they would repeat other words connected with that. They found a lot of these fears came from early childhood relationship with the mother, with the sister, with the father some strange happenings, some unfortunate happenings in childhood, and they remain suppressed. So when words like father, mother, sister, brother, uncle, when these were used, the old experience brought up that reaction, 
and although it was considered forgotten, the subconscious never forgets it and creates the complex of fear or other complexes creating psychological problems. So they used to use this free association of ideas technology in order to reach at that forgotten memory. Then they would play it up as if it is to be relived and make the patient go through a psychological tense situation but and find out there was nothing much in it after all. And giving the information, the positive knowledge of that experience, that now you know what is there to be afraid of. Most of the time they succeeded and once the patient found out that once you know what has happened, there is nothing to be afraid of, the complex disappeared. This was one approach. The other approach was to use the dreams because it was felt that during sleep, while we are dreaming, the subconscious still speaks up and does not hide the memories which we don't want to remember during wakeful state. But the dreams speak up in symbols instead of speaking up directly in the incident which had happened. For example, if a man raped a woman when she was a young girl and she continues to have fears and can't go on a certain street, can't go shopping, can't go with a bag, has associations, which she cannot connect at all. Then in the dream she may be seeing a particular knife flying over her head, which may be a symbolic representation of the incident of rape that happened earlier. So then a large, voluminous bibliography of these symbols came up to say that if you have these kinds of dreams, these are the kinds of memories that are hiding, and those symbols in the dreams were then used to bring up those old memories, relive them, give the knowledge to the patient and make that patient all right. These were the two approaches. When I conducted the workshop, there are 20 psychologists, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists participated. And uh, they heard my presentation because it was unusual for them. Because they had not heard that besides this process of memory being suppressed, there was a possibility of moving to a different level of consciousness, which is called the intuitive level, that can automatically give you a certainty of knowledge that is not even given by recall of memory. And that once you have access to your own intuitive self, you can solve the problem of fear without having to relive any of the old memories. This was a new approach. I not only uh, presented this uh, proposition, but they applied this method on their patients for six months and we had a review session. It was a very successful conclusion. In fact, that year I was invited by several medical institutions in this country, but because of my government responsibilities in India, I could not come. But I saw the immense potential for switching over from that part of the conscious system which creates fear and uncertainty to another part of the conscious system which removes fear. Now, will it surprise you that all of us sitting here have both the systems intact and available, but we are overusing, draining the system that creates fear, don't even touch the system that removes fear. What are these two systems in consciousness which we all have? One is the system that thinks and creates fear. One is the system that has a hunch, has intuition and removes fear. When we send our children to school and college, how many schools and colleges teach our children how to have intuition and fearlessness? None, almost none. And all of them teach them how to think. And by thinking, how to be afraid. So much afraid that they can't face day-to-day -day life. Look at the suicide rate. Look at the stories we are hearing every day. They are natural consequence of a society, of a civilization that emphasizes the importance of thinking, ignoring the other potential of intuition within the same consciousness. It is not that there are some special yogis standing upside down on their heads who have intuition. Everyone has intuition. 
Now, you are sitting here as a group in this room. May I ask you, has any one of you ever felt a sudden hunch, an intuitive feeling which was not connected with your thoughts but just came like a flash? Please raise your hands if you ever had that. There are so many great yogis sitting here. The intuition comes to each one of us. Why don't we listen to it? Because we are trained to use our thoughts, our intellectual process, our heads. Use your head. Sometimes they distinguish between head and heart. Instead of listening to your heart, use your head. Don't get blown over by this feeling that you get. There is no certainty about them. And yet in actual human experience, it is the intuitive feeling alone that gives certainty and fearlessness and not the thinking process. In the East, in the spiritual tradition of the Eastern masters, this fact was recognized centuries ago. They said, what you call a human being does not consist merely of so many physical cells, bone cells, brain cells, blood cells, various cells of different tissues. It is not merely this physical being that is human. This physical body is just like any other body. If you look at any other body of a mammal, it is very similar to the body of a human being. What distinguishes a human being from all other living things, including all other mammals, is the capacity of a human being to make choices or the capacity of a human being to experience this strange thing called free will. This experience of free will, I have to do this, should I or should I not? I have to go this way, should I go right or left? This unique feature of choosing between options is available only to human beings in the whole process of living creation upon this planet. You look at all the living things and they are all programmed instinctively to follow one pattern. They are all programmed to do exactly what the program says without thinking, except human beings. Human beings are the only ones who make choices. And this uniqueness of the human being is at once a great benefit and a great boon and at the same time a great disadvantage and a handicap. Why is that? Because this very choice making can enable a human being to find out answers to such questions as what am I here for? Why am I in this world? What is this world? Who is the creator? Who made it? Have I a role? Do I have a purpose in life? What is life for? Can question all these things and therefore find answers that go beyond the physical known experiences of this universe, such as spiritual answers, such as going to higher levels of consciousness, such as discovering God, such as discovering some power that has created everything, such as inventing God if necessary. All these possibilities have come to human beings because of this unique ability to make choices between alternatives. The disadvantage is that in trying to make choices, the human being feels helpless. What is the better choice? And once you have free will, you automatically become a moral animal. You cannot remain, uh, remain a mechanical machine. Because when you have to make a choice, you want to make a choice between alternatives and have to determine which is good and which is bad, which is better or worse. And that raises morality and the whole law of morality immediately. Therefore, the human being is the only moral being who has to make moral decisions just by virtue of having this choice-making ability. The disadvantage is you make bad choices and are afflicted by guilt. There is not, no other living thing that is guilt. Guilt can make you feel miserable. Even when you have everything fine, you can feel guilty and feel miserable. 
So human beings can use the same uniqueness of free will to make themselves happy or to make themselves miserable. So it is a strange two-edged weapon that we've got and makes us unique. But this process that creates the feeling we can make choices also gives us the option of using two parts of our consciousness which can be used to decide what to do. Supposing we all have a problem of deciding what to do. We all have this question coming up every day. Even simple things. Should I have tea or coffee? Should I do it or not do it? Every day we have to decide. We are on crossroads every day. Should I cook this for meals or no? Should I listen to this telephone conversation or not? All kinds of little, little things are happening which make us determine what to do or not to do. But do we know how, what to use in our system to resolve this? What, what method should we use to decide which way to go? The Indian tradition says there are only two methods. One is the mental method, the other is the spiritual method. If you don't like this terminology, the other terminology is you can think your way to deciding what to do or you can hunch your way to decide what to do. Either you can listen to your hunch or you can listen to your thoughts. What's the difference? Where are they coming from two separate segments of the human system or are they the same thing? The traditional Indian mystics have elaborated upon this point. They have said, do not think that this physical body, the physical apparatus is the whole of you. That part of the seeking and decision making that is coming into you is coming from a higher self. You may call it higher, you may call it different, you may call it living, you may call it vital, give it any name. But they say, that the conscious apparatus in the body is not a material apparatus. It is not that because you have a certain kind of brain, therefore you become conscious. We often think that because we have a brain, therefore we are conscious. We do not consider that because we are conscious, therefore we know we have a brain. Supposing we were not conscious, we would know nothing. The first, first a priori consideration was that we were conscious. Does consciousness come first or does it come as a function of something else? We have been led to believe that consciousness is a function. It is not a being. That a being must be there to be conscious. Therefore, we are there and we are conscious. In which case, if we are not there, if we die, consciousness must be snuffed out. If somebody says consciousness is not snuffed out, then we must think there should be reincarnation. We must have a being somewhere to be conscious. Therefore, we take the being as more real than consciousness which we consider as a function. The truth is that consciousness itself could be a being. And when that being uses an aid like a human body, we call it a human being who is alive. And consciousness may still be floating around in order to be manifest in any other being. So, consciousness could have its own entity not tied down to any manifest being. But we do not know. It's very difficult because we've never seen consciousness per se. We have only seen conscious beings. If we could see consciousness, then we would have a different definition. But it's not possible to see that. Therefore, we are in this rigmarole of indecision as to what is consciousness and what can we do about it. And it seems to operate from the head and we can think out all these thoughts and those intuitions, they come rarely. We don't know much about them. So we get trapped into a very limited knowledge of ourselves. But the Eastern mystic tradition says, it is not that difficult to find out that within your consciousness, within your awareness, there are two distinct things working. One is working within a span of time, space, and cause and effect, a continuous chain of cause and effect. And that they call the mind. 
in Eastern tradition, we call it mind. And there is another part of consciousness functioning within the same being, which is not tied down by time, space, and not following any laws of cause and effect. And that they call the soul. They don't mix up the two. They don't say mind and soul is the same thing, or soul is a super mind or a super function of mind. They say there is such a basic difference between the soul of a human being and the mind of a human being. You can't mix them up because one operates totally within the limitations of time, space, causation framework, and the other operates totally outside of it. How can you mix them up? And they give examples of the functions of the mind and the functions of the soul to distinguish between the two and to tell us that each one of us has both at all times and we can check whenever we like. What are the functions of the mind? The functions of the mind are A, the lower function or function of the lower mind is to interpret the sense perceptions which the bodily and imaginative senses are giving us. The bodily sense perception comes to us through the bodily organs of sense and when those stimuli come to consciousness, we interpret them into meaningful things. This interpretative function or the sensing function is called the lower function of the mind. The middle function of the mind is thinking, reasoning, applying logic, to the situations that come before us. It generally uses the elements of the same sense perception and uses them in different combinations to create logical inferences, to come to decisions. The logical process is a process where we can link different statements in words being put into our head and put them in a certain logical way so each gets tagged on to the next by a cause and effect relationship and the end should be an inference or a conclusion. If it is logical, if all the links are complete, we say that is right, it makes sense. This is the middle function, which is a thinking or reasoning function of the mind that is taking place. The third or the top function of the mind is creativity. To put the elements of perception in new diagrams and patterns and come out with a new thing and say, it's a very creative activity of the mind. There is nothing being created except rearrangement of the elements of perception. If you observe carefully these three functions of the mind, the sensing, the reasoning and the creating are all taking place continuously within us and they all have a beginning, a middle and an end. And they all follow a cause and effect relationship. Consider thought as one of the principal functions of the mind. That's the middle function. I am taking this example of thought or thinking because this is one function that never ceases. It never stops. The mind will think day and night whether you are awake or you are asleep. So if you want to check is the mind thinking, what thought, you just have to listen in and you will see the mind is thinking. You can hear the mind thinking. These thoughts that come into our head all the time, there is no thought anybody has ever had which didn't have a beginning, a middle and an end. There is no thought that anybody ever had which does not have a duration. There is no thought that anybody has ever had which did not have a space in which it was expressed. Therefore, thinking is always confined to these dimensions of time, space and causation. The same thing is true of sensing or creating. Now, this thinking, sensing, creating, reasoning, they are mental activities and we sometimes group them together to say they are intellectual activities of a human being. And what is the other part? The soul. The soul is also performing functions. Similarly, all the time, which are those functions? The first one is intuition. A sudden knowing of something without any cause without time, without space, not knowing at all where it came from and suddenly you know it, that kind of a hunch, illogical, not connected with thinking, which comes to us from time to time, 
for which you raised your hand a little while ago, that is not a mental function. It is a function ascribed to the soul or the spirit of a human being or to a more basic core of consciousness than the mind represents. In the description of the different parts of the human form, the soul or the spirit of consciousness is considered the core, the mind occupying the periphery around that core, the senses operating outside the mind and the physical body enveloping all of them. As if this is the outermost cover, the physical body, all others are operating within it. So the soul which gives us the experience of intuition is the inmost core of the human consciousness. What is the other function? Love. When you experience a sudden concern for someone, an identification with another, you have had experience of love. Anybody here had experience of love? Anybody? Please raise your hands. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You know that when that sudden feeling of love for somebody comes, it is not a logical feeling. It, it does not follow any rules of time, space, causation. In fact, I have not come across a single person. I would like to meet a person who said, I didn't have the feeling of love, but I thought and I thought and I thought and I suddenly got love for somebody. I haven't met such a person. On the other hand, I have met thousands of people who said suddenly we had a strong feeling of love out of nowhere for a person. And then as we thought and thought about it, we said, are you sure about it? And we destroyed that love. Therefore, love, the experience of love, the experience of identification with another in a strange way where one is willing to forget the ego or the self. That does not come from the mental, mental function. The mental function keeps our individual I, the individual ego right in front. When you are operating mentally, what is up front in the conscious process is the I. I want to do this. I want to do this. This I is so strong that if I is not kept in that position, it feels insulted and is willing to attack and be violent. Therefore, experiences like intuition and love they do not come from that part of the self which puts I in front. In fact, when you have love for somebody, the I is pushed back. And who takes the place? The beloved, the one you love. This experience where the person you love can occupy your awareness, suddenly take the place of the very dimension, very place where I was occupying. That love is not a mental function. You cannot create it mentally. It is a soul function or a function of the spirit of a human being and it takes place for no cause, out of time, has no beginning and no end. The third function of the spirit is aesthetic function, the feeling of beauty. Oh, when do you feel something is beautiful? You say it's a beautiful day. Now when you say it's a beautiful day, nothing has happened to the day. It's just a strange feeling. Consciousness gets in the same way as one gets the feeling of love or gets the feeling of intuition. But supposing one were to start analyzing or thinking about what makes it so beautiful. Open the window. What a wonderful, beautiful day. It looks great. And you start saying, are the trees taller or greener today or the sun is shining in a particular way? And as you analyze, the beauty that you first experience disappears. Therefore, you will find that the two functions of the soul and of the mind that operate continuously in the human being, they contribute to different feelings and different experiences in us. If we educate ourselves and grow up and civilize ourselves, only using and overusing the mental process, we are denying to ourselves the benefits of the spiritual process or the soul process. We are therefore curtailing the happenings we call love, intuition and beauty and supplanting it by thinking, reasoning, analysis. Now, we can overdo this thinking and we have overdone this thinking to a point where we have all become frightened of our own existence. 
We are afraid of everything. We are afraid of what step to take. We are afraid of who we are going to meet. We are afraid of what may happen tomorrow. All the ignorance which is possible through an analysis of the situation of life creates fear for us. So we are afraid because we have become mental, because we have become intellectual. And so long as we remain mental and intellectual and ignore the spiritual side of ourselves, fear will remain part of ourselves. Fear is natural for a person who thinks too much. Consider the most frightened people. They are thinking constantly, violently. They can't sleep. They keep on thinking. And a person, simple person says, forget it, there is nothing to think about. Enjoy. Look at life. Look at God. Look at creation. The person is fearless. Can do things fearless. The intellectual may say that person is not fearless, he is stupid. But the other person says, for your cleverness and avoiding stupidity, you are paying a very heavy price. You are paying the price of fear. You are paying the price of uncertainty. You are paying the price of denying to yourself. Such beautiful experiences like intuition and love. You think uh, that it is better to be analytical than to have these things. There is no answer the intellectual can give and there is no communication between them. You will notice that anything that we try to put in the mental frame suffers from lack of communication. And this looks strange because all the communications we are trying are through the mental process. If you want to speak to a person, supposing you want to tell somebody something, there is a intellectual or mental way of saying something and there is a spiritual way of saying something. The mental way is to speak in the <coughs> language, the spoken written language which we have been taught in schools and colleges, which we attended through the development of our minds and the intellectual skills. Now, if you speak to somebody to say something, you should be able to communicate pretty good. But during my counseling sessions, I remember when I counseled people, their biggest problem was they are unable to communicate. Communicate with the very people with whom they speak all the time. In fact, I was very amused sometimes to hear of two people meeting on a relationship and feeling so strongly pulled to each other and so happy and good with each other till they opened their mouth and started talking. And then the whole thing went into misunderstandings. They called them misunderstandings. When you speak, why should there be misunderstanding? There should be understanding. What makes a person misunderstand when you speak and understand when you are quiet? There must be some good reason for it. The reason is simple. That when you are trying to use this spoken language, you are putting your mind into it. And when you are not doing it, you are putting your intuition and your soul into it. I have sometimes given example of my Tours, when I would meet people in distress, and if I tried to give a discourse and lecture to them, look, he's strong, these are distresses and calamities that come to all people, we have to be strong and meet them. They say, Go, you haven't felt what it is. Only the wearer of the shoe knows where it is, where the shoe pinches. Get away, you are in a good position, therefore you don't know what we suffer from. All my talk would have no effect. I would go and meet those people and say nothing. Sometimes just hold somebody's hand. Just sit for a while. Say nothing whatsoever. And there was much greater communication than with all the words I could speak. What kind of communication is that? Today in management we are teaching the importance of the non-verbal agenda. We say if you want a meeting to be successful, lay more emphasis on the non-verbal agenda of the meeting rather than on what is going to be said. Because the non-verbal is much deeper communication and does not come from the same mental process, the same intellectual process you are used to. You can touch a person in the spiritual self if you are also operating at that self. You will see an intuitive person. You spend some time with an intuitive person. And none of you may speak and see the happiness that you get. Anyone, any one of you have tried that? 
you just spend time with an intuitive person without speaking and see how many of your questions are resolved, doubts disappear and a feeling of well-being and a feeling of being able to do what you are supposed to do comes back. Where is it that communication taking place? There is something more that transmits between people than the spoken words of the intellectual thinking mind. So, if we were to live in that type of life, intuitively, with our souls and spirits more than with our minds, what would happen to our fears? The fears would become less and less and less. Now, this is not a hypothesis. Looks like a hypothesis that I am presenting before you a possible way in which fear can be overcome, that live your life intuitively, don't listen to your mind, every morning get up and see what the hunch for the day is and go ahead and do it, and then you will be fearless. I am not suggesting that. I am suggesting have access within yourself to that part of yourself. In the same way, like a therapist would say, have access to your subconscious. I am not saying have access to your subconscious, it's best you open up. I am saying have access to the best part of your conscious self, which is the intuitive self, the spiritual self. If you have contact with your own spiritual self, you will be fearless, personally. And I am saying experientially, experimentally try it out. Don't uh, leave it to somebody else to try and tell you. Personally try it out, it doesn't cost you anything. How do we have access to our own self? Then again, the answer is very simple. If the spoken words seem to go out of ourselves to communicate, then there must be something that remains inward and communicates better. The communication of silence, the eloquence of silence as the Greeks once spoke of, that came from something that remained inside, not that went outside. So, the eloquence that you need in communication by remaining silent must come by your being within yourself, not outside. Now, you will see that these very two beings in us, the mind and the spirit, they perform opposite functions. The mind tends to put you outside and the spirit tends to put you inside. The more you think, the more you are outside. The more you experience your own self, the more you are inside. What is the meaning of inside? People have used this word within, inside, go within, this the kingdom of heaven is within. Within, they use this word within. Within what? There must be within something. Within what? Within yourself. Oh, who is the self? We don't even know what the self is. If consciousness is the self, let us understand what is the meaning of within, which puts us in touch with the spiritual self that removes fear, and without or outside, which puts us in touch with the things that are mental and create fear. What are those things that the thoughts create? The thoughts take us to desires and attachments. You will notice that we have desires coming from the sense perceptions and the sensory systems not necessarily physical senses, the sensory system as such, per se, without the physical body also you can have senses, like in the dream you can have a sense perception, in imagination you can have it. These sense perceptions lead to desires, the mind by thinking and ruminating and contemplating on those, goes outward to satisfy the desires and creates attachments. And you will notice that all our desires that we have had, have had one effect, Put our consciousness out of ourselves, outside. What is the process employed? The process employed is the flow of attention. Our attention is the substance which flows up from consciousness and attaches itself to various experiences outside the body. And those we call attachments. When we want to meditate, some people want to meditate, they say, we want to gain some peace, we are too much troubled in this life and we want to sit peacefully, close our eyes and meditate. And I always tell them, it's excellent if you can meditate 
and uh, put yourself within yourself, it's excellent to get peace. But when they close their eyes and sit to meditate, they think of all those things which are outside. They are not inside at all. By closing the eyes, they don't remain inside. Their thoughts constantly take them to the very attachments which are outside. What are these attachments? They have come from the same thinking function of the mind that I spoke of earlier. And these attachments keep us outside. Therefore, if you think more, you are more outside. Therefore, obviously, whoever said to find the truth, you have to go within, he was obviously saying, if you have to go within, do not rely upon the thinking process, rely upon something else. So, thinking is constantly creating attachments outside. How do they come within? What is the other process? Is there any other process known to us which can put us back to our own conscious self other than thought? Now, this has puzzled people, and the spiritual prescription that came from the mystics remained a secret for a long time. It is still a big secret. It's a very big secret that we have access to something that is other than thinking and can keep us within ourselves. Now, what is that kind of realization that comes and makes us conscious of our own self? That realization is called love. It is so powerful a phenomenon, so powerful a human experience. It is love that can put you in touch with your own self. Now, I am making this statement realizing that many of you may question it based upon your own experience of what you thought was love. But that must be distinguished from attachments. I am saying attachment is a function that takes you outside. Love is a function that takes you inside. And the distinction between the two must be remembered. Because if you have attachment and you call it love, it doesn't become love. What is the difference between attachment and love? We use the word love for both. I see a lot of people saying to each other, especially in this country, I love you. Here, do you love me? Say you love me. Why don't you tell me? How much do you love me? There's so much questioning and dialogue going on to reaffirm that there is love. I almost suspect that there is must be some doubt in their mind that they want so much affirmation like Lady Macbeth. They said, Methinks she doth protest too much. That we have to talk so much about it, it creates a question mark. When there is a feeling and experience of two, it is attached. Whenever a person says, I love you, and that person is conscious of I, you, and love, that is attachment, though the word love has been used. Why is that? Because first of all, the elementary form of the intellectual process of I is there foremost. I love you. As if I have done something in the process in which I am having this experience with you. I is intact. Supposing somebody says to you, I love you, and you say, but I hate you. That other person says, then I hate you too. What happened to that love? It is only an ego game. It is a mental intellectual process that is going on of one I against another I. And supposing you say that no, both of them are together. You can be as together as you like. But the ego game doesn't finish just by being together. Together still means two are together. <laughs> two are still there. What's love? What happens in love? When you fall in love with somebody, you forget who you are. Then who occupies that space in mind? You. That is why this definition became very popular about 10 or 15 years ago in this country. And I remember when people said, I love you is an ego statement, but you, you, you is the love statement. And mugs were sold and people made millions of dollars. Mugs marked you, you, you. And this kind of thing also became an intellectual game once again. 
But the point I am making is, when you love somebody and are concerned about that being, that being fills your awareness. And you can do nothing about it. It is not that you want to love, therefore you are loving. Or you, that you plan to love. You can plan to have an attachment. You can plan to have a relationship. You can plan to have a good time. You can plan to go out for a vacation. You can plan to do various things. But you can't plan to love somebody. Love comes spontaneously. As if from nowhere. At a time when the logic least expects it. Therefore, that experience of identification with another is the only way known to human beings so far, according to the Eastern mystic tradition. The only way that human ego can be put in the second place and allowed to discover the spirituality is love. There is no other human experience that puts the ego behind. Love is the only experience that can make one realize that there is something other than that ego which was always trying to play a game. So love is the real answer. I have some buttons, I didn't bring any, which say, love is the answer no matter what the question. It's true. Love is the answer to all our questions because love is the, is the word we are using for that expression of identification with one. When we talk of oneness, we are talking of love. When we are talking of togetherness, we are talking of attachment. Therefore, when I say that on the one hand we can use mental attachments to scatter ourselves outside and use love to gather ourselves inside, gives you the answer to the two possibilities. Love inside can put us in touch with our own self and make us into it. Now, I will tell you a very interesting thing. I have seen people so much intoxicated by love, so much intoxicated by love. They forget things. They, they don't remember. They're, the only thing they know is the beloved, the one they love. They are so much filled up with love. They are the, they are the ones who are having the maximum number of intuitive feelings. They are the ones who are having all these experiences which take them in touch with that beauty, which they express. They don't connect it with love, but it is connected with love, because they are in touch with the core of their own being, their own real self, their own spirit, their own soul. Therefore, do not mix up the soul as being the same thing as the mind. The mind throws us out, the soul brings us in. Attachments take us out, and love brings us in. Supposing you have love for one person, just one person so occupies your mind that nothing else matters, not even you, and that happens, and you don't think about it, but soak that in and allow it to work, what will happen? You will find a real change, a sea change in your attitude towards everybody else, as if you have fallen in love with everybody else. We don't need to have a very well-cultivated humanitarian attitude of love all beings, love everybody. People say that. But people who are trying, pretending to love everybody, they are gritting their teeth and clenching their fists inside. I wish I could teach him a lesson, but I am supposed to love everybody. That is not love. But if you love one person, to the exclusion of everything, and you meet other people, they will say, we never met a more loving person. Now, you are not trying to love anybody else. You have love for one being, and that transforms you into a loving person for everybody that you come across. This is the effect of love. So, love is not an externalized expression of relationships. <laughs> love is a transformation from the mental to the spiritual self within ourselves. This has been recognized by mystics around the world. I do not know a single mystic or a single master who ever taught that love is a negative thing. Whoever said that God has to be found by something other than love. In fact, the mystics have gone that far to emphasize this point 
they not only say love is the method, love is the way to find God, they say love is God. They go to that extent, they say if you have experienced love, you have experienced God. If you want to experience the inmost part of your being and you have experienced love, you have experienced the inmost part of your being. If something tugs at you and brings you out, that is the only negativity around you. If you can let go and re rejoice and get intoxicated in love, you have found the contact with the inmost being, which is the same as God. Therefore, God realization is the same as love experience or love realization. So love is not a small thing. But love cannot be made into a mental device or a mental exercise. One cannot say, now that's a good lecture I heard. Love is the answer. I am going to love from tomorrow morning. Let me see. Now, which, which one should I figure out? Who am I? That person looks pretty smart. That's Stan. He gave me nice pizza on birthday. A good guy to love. Okay, now let me see how I can love that person. If you plan like that, you will remain in this intellectual game of throwing these attentions here and there without having any experience of your own self. That is why the Persian mystic said, Ishq avval dar dile mashuk paida mishwad. Love is first born in the heart of the beloved. Supposing there is no love from the beloved, you cannot love. It's lover-beloved relationship. We are distinguishing between this. As if somebody is experiencing love for somebody and thinks, I love that person. As if there is a flow from the lover to the beloved. The mystic says, no, it cannot happen like that. What happens is, the beloved that draws that experience of love out of you has love for you beforehand, before you get the feeling of loving somebody. Therefore, love is an experience where you are drawn out by the beloved. In the, in the traditional East, we had no problem understanding these things. Because the relationship of the teacher and the taught in these matters, in these subjects, subjects of reality, subjects of human consciousness, subjects of spirituality, subjects of soul, who we are, what we are here for, why we have a soul like this, why we are seeking in us, all these questions were answered and instruction given in a very personal relationship between the teacher and the taught. That was called the Guru-Chela relationship. The Guru-Chela relationship or the relationship of a master and a disciple was a unique one because it could immediately focus in on the enlightenment and the wisdom of the teacher and the love that the wisdom drew out of the students. The disciples were drawn to the teacher not by his eloquence, not by the way he could analyze problems, not by the number of books he wrote, not by anything else except the love with which he could draw you up. And when he could affect you to make you love him, he had done his job. A successful spiritual teacher was that in the Eastern tradition who could make the disciples have the experience of real love. Because once they had that experience, they were transformed into fearless people, living this life in a fearless way, meeting and coping up with the day-to-day -day problems fearlessly and being certain of what they were supposed to do. And their life, internal and external, was tuned in. This tuning in is a very interesting experience for those who are fearless and leading a spiritual life. How does it get tuned in? Because outside circumstances when they come, which hit us with fear, because of the uncertainty of what might come, we are going around the street corner, we don't know what is behind that. Every time we go, we see somebody, we have to run away. And therefore, we are, we are afraid to go. These fears that are created by day-to-day -day circumstances of life are replaced. When the intuition is strong, Instead of meeting these unknown, frightening question marks, 
at every corner of our life, we start meeting something different for which a word has been used called coincidence. You heard that word coincidence? The coincidence is a remarkable experience in human life. Things which we can't explain why they should happen at that time. This was a strange coincidence. You will find the more spiritual you turn, the more love you experience, the more intuitive you are, the more coincidences start coming into your life. And they happen in such an uncanny way. You marvel, how could this be organized? You start feeling there may be some other power organizing all this. You start having faith where you had none. Your disbelief, your uncertainty, all these are being replaced by this process of coincidence alone. So the external circumstances of life alter along with the internal. A person who has love in his heart finds all the things happening exactly as they were supposed to happen. Without dropping on the way, a person who is not at peace with himself is badgered by the possibilities, this may not happen, that may not happen, finds things don't happen at the right time outside. What is this relationship? Why do the external circumstances correspond so closely with what is happening internally to the person. Is there an explanation for that? The outside life looks like it is so set, things should happen when they happen. But when we transform ourselves internally, why should the external life change? People who always miss the bus, when they are in love, the bus is delayed till they reach. I've seen that happen. Have you seen that happen? Have you seen such transformations taking place not in the personal attitude or personal life, but in the very facts, the episodes of life happening outside, as if somebody is taking care of them, as if they have become the beloveds of somebody, as if the creator himself or the core of our own totality, as if our soul has a totality of its own, which has power over all things, including the so-called outside creation. And when we are in touch with ourself, that soul, through its permanence and eminence everywhere, is controlling not only what's happening to us, but is controlling the things outside, as if it is guiding us. And people become spiritual and they start making statements, there is God and I know God helps me every day. This happens. Nobody can understand why they are saying it. They are saying it because they are in touch with their soul. If anybody is in touch with the soul within, all these external changes take place along with the internal. 